again, thanks so much for joining us for our first webinar in our career series, where today we're going to be going over a topic that many of us at some point in our life will face a career transition. You're going to learn all about how you can translate your existing skills to new positions and opportunities, how to stand out from the competition when applying to that new position, and for the military folks joining us today, how to transition from military to civilian jobs. I'm joined once again by our fantastic presenters, Rachel Ekman and Jenna Gilio, as they walk you through this sometimes daunting process. So without further ado, I'll pass it on over to them. Thank you, Maxine, for the introduction. So as Maxine shared, today is the first of a three-part webinar series focused on career transition, where we'll lead you through the initial stages of planning and preparation, to resume writing and application searching all the way through to your interview. And today we'll be starting by defining what a career transition is. We'll consider possible motivations for making a career transition, as well as evaluate the pros and cons. We'll outline how to effectively plan and budget for a career transition. Talk about how you can assess and leverage your skills and experiences. And then finally, we'll discuss some additional considerations for military career transitions. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rachel to kick us off. Thanks, Jenna, and thank you everyone for joining us today or for watching After the Fact on our YouTube channel. Let's start off today by defining what a career transition is. A career transition is much more than just working for company A and then moving to work for company B. It's the process of beginning a career on a completely different track, or maybe even in a totally new industry. You're not just going to work for a new company, you're changing the trajectory of your career. This is a big life change. Whatever your reason is, you've made the decision to leave a very significant part of your life behind in the pursuit of a new path. It takes courage, time, planning, and a little bit of reinvention to be done successfully. You're probably already familiar with the term great resignation. In the wake of the pandemic, Americans were quitting their jobs at unprecedented rates. 47 million people quit their jobs in 2021 and another 38 million in 2022. But you may not know that it's also often referred to as the great reshuffle. Of the more than 4 million workers who have quit their jobs every single month since April 2021, more than half of them made a career transition. If you're considering or already planning a career transition, you're not alone. This means two important things for your job search. Number one, you're in great company. <laughs> and number two, today's job market is uniquely receptive to career transitions. Today, Jenna and I will walk you through the transition process in detail, and that begins with the very first question. Why are you making this change? And Jenna is going to have some really great insights for us on that one. Thanks, Rachel. So now that we've defined what a career transition is, let's take a moment to consider your why. What is motivating your career change? Are you looking to increase your salary and earning potential? Well, there's no shame in that. In fact, an edX survey found that 39% of those who thought about or who had already changed careers did so for a salary increase. It's important to be realistic about whether your current earning potential is going to allow you to achieve your goals. But if your sole motivator comes down to money, a career transition might not be your best option. A career transition often involves a move down and not up the ladder of responsibility, at least in the short term. And Rachel's going to share a little bit more about this in a few minutes. But for now, let's move on to the second key motivator, satisfaction. You don't need a logical reason to make a career transition. Sometimes it simply boils down to a lack of satisfaction. Maybe there aren't opportunities for you to grow, take on new responsibilities, or expand your skill set in your current role or field. Or perhaps you're unhappy with leadership. Things like lack of recognition, low compensation, and minimal benefits are all key factors associated with poor leadership and can be detrimental to the overall satisfaction of workers. You might consider checking out resources like Glassdoor or LinkedIn to see what current and former employees have to say about their experience with the company you're considering. Another common motivator is flexibility. 
a work schedule that once fit your needs as a single and recent college graduate may no longer fit your needs as you find a partner or decide to expand your family. Do you have plans to travel or maybe even relocate entirely? What about hobbies? Does your current position allow you the flexibility to make time for your interests? For many employees, a career transition comes down to where they can find optimal independence and flexibility that meets their individual needs. Another consideration is a shift in goals. Maybe you've gotten a little too comfortable in your current field and you're looking to find ways to challenge yourself. Perhaps your values or goals have shifted and your current role no longer aligns with them. Or maybe you're looking to live out your passion and find fulfillment through a field that supports it. These are just a few of the many reasons why employees might consider a career transition. Whatever your personal motivation, identifying your why can help drive your how, your what, and your when when it comes to making that change. After you've identified your motivations, consider the risks and rewards of making a career transition. First, how long is it going to take? And are you prepared to invest that time? Factors such as continuing your education and the time it takes to climb the ladder and reach your goal position are worth considering. If time isn't on your side, there are multiple ways of making a career transition. Maybe changing your track within the same industry could be a better fit than changing industries altogether. Next, do you already meet the education requirements of your desired role or will it require you to go back to school? And with that, what will be the financial impact? Are you prepared for the cost of continuing your education or does the financial risk outweigh the reward? Keep in mind, again, a career transition is often associated with a temporary salary decrease as you establish yourself in a new field. So you'll wanna account for that when making your decision. Also worth considering is whether the desired position aligns with your values. This might include factors such as a greater salary, opportunities for remote work, and minimal travel requirements. Though, of course, it's going to vary from person to person. Consider making a list of your personal values and see how your desired role stacks up next to them. And finally, what opportunities does your goal position offer you? Will there be room to advance and expand your skill set? And is the industry shrinking or is it growing? If you're unsure, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is a great place to start. If you already have a goal position or field in mind, or if there are any you'd just like to begin exploring, the Occupational Outlook Handbook is an excellent resource. Simply visit the US Bureau of Labor Statistics website at bls.gov and click on the Publications tab. From there, you can select the Occupational Outlook Handbook. You can then use the search bar to begin exploring your desired position or any other position you might be interested in. And if you have your mobile device handy, you can also do a quick scan of one of the provided QR codes to download the handbook app and explore that way. Since I'm a former elementary teacher, we'll use that as an example. So after searching elementary teacher, I'm brought to this page. And from here, there are several tabs that I can explore from what they do, how I can become one, what the pay looks like, et cetera. And just below the tabs, I can also view a summary, which provides a handful of facts about the position at a glance. So in this case, I can quickly identify the median salary for elementary teachers is 61,000 per year. It requires a bachelor's degree and the position is expected to grow 4% by 2031, which is about average. Now, let's imagine I've decided to make a career transition out of elementary education, and I'm interested in the field of computer programming. And looking at the summary for computer programmers, the median pay is about 93,000 per year, an increase from the median pay for elementary teachers. However, the job outlook between 2021 and 2031 is expected to decline by 10%, which is not ideal. I'm still interested in the field, but now I'm questioning whether this is the right role for me. And this is where the similar occupations tab comes into play. 
So here's a list of occupations the handbook identifies as similar to computer programmers. For each position, you can see a quick description, any education requirements, and the median salary. So let's return to our scenario. After skimming through the list, I'm intrigued by the information security analyst position. I can see here it requires a bachelor's degree in the same field as computer programming. The median salary is even higher at about 103,000 per year. So I select the position to find out a little bit more. And according to the summary for information security analysts, the job typically requires less than five years of experience in a related position. And even more, the job outlook expects the position to grow 35% by 2031, which is much faster than average. So perhaps this position could be a better fit. But what if you wanna make a career transition and don't have any positions or fields in mind? Where do you even begin? In reality, when I decided I wanted to transition out of teaching, I had the same questions. I knew a career change was the right decision for me, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do next. It was really important for me to find a position that was stable and allowed me the potential for growth, but I was overwhelmed by the possibilities and I didn't know where to start. Fortunately, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has resources for these instances too. The Employment Projections tool provides a comprehensive list of job positions and allows job seekers to filter them by projected growth, number of job openings, required education, work experience, et cetera. So if you're making a career transition, but you don't have a particular position in mind, this tool essentially allows you to work backwards to find one that meets your, your needs and your goals. Now, if you scroll down on the employment projections tool page, you'll find the spreadsheet where you can begin applying some of those filters. So in this case, I'm filtering by employment percent change between 2021 and 2031. And you can see here that the three jobs with the highest projected growth include nurse practitioners, wind turbine technicians, and ushers, lobby attendants, and ticket takers. Now, if one of these positions piques your interest, great. But more than likely, you'll need to continue filtering and scrolling until you've gathered a handful of positions that meets your personal requirements. Then you can simply plug those positions into the Occupational Outlook Handbook we just explored to learn more about them. So we have barely just skimmed the surface of the resources available to you as you begin your career transition. And Rachel's going to share a few more that you can add to your toolkit here in a moment. But I highly encourage you to play around with these resources on your own and discover what else is available. But for now, I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel, and she's going to talk about how you can assess your financial readiness before making a career change. Before making any major career change, you want to thoroughly evaluate your readiness. I would like to stress here, though, that this isn't necessarily an evaluation for the purpose of ruling out a career transition. It's not about should I or shouldn't I. This is just about knowing what you need to do to prepare. We're evaluating how best you can poise yourself to make the change you want. Of course, there is always the possibility that through the evaluation process, you may decide that a career, complete career transition isn't necessarily for you. Maybe the change you want, as Jenna touched on earlier, is really just a different company or a management track or a transition to education within your field of expertise. The evaluation process isn't meant to rule out. It's to look before you leap. Whatever you decide, the goal here is to make the most informed, carefully calculated decision possible. In some situations, it will be possible to do a career transition that involves a somewhat lateral move with a comparable or maybe even higher salary. In other cases, you may have to start working your way up from an entry level, and that could quite possibly include a temporary salary decrease. In either case, though, it is always best practice to be financially prepared when making any type of career or job change, even if it is just from one company to another. When you're working at the same job with the same salary for a decent length of time, it's very easy to become somewhat complacent when it comes to updating and maintaining your budget. But before you make any career change of any kind, it's essential to get back on that ball. 
on average, around 64% of our spending goes to housing, transportation, and food in that order. These are costs that may not be easily trimmed. The housing market is volatile. We can't control the price of oil, unfortunately. <laughs> and inflation being what it is, people's grocery bills are at a historical high. But even if we can't make changes to those big three, that still leaves us with 36% of potential flexibility. Anytime you update a budget, you will almost certainly find a number of non-essential places where you're spending a lot more than you've realized. I call it a spending creep because it's usually the result of a slow but steady progression over time. There are some usual suspects to look out for. We'll give you a few examples. Let's start with coffee. <laughs> the average Starbucks drinker spends around $3,000 a year at Starbucks. Now, the median salary in the U.S. is about $42,800. At that salary, you're spending 7% of your annual income on a coffee beverage. And even if you skip the Starbucks for a less pricey cup at average just under $2 each, your coffee bill will still climb to over $1,100 annually. So brewing at home can literally save you thousands of dollars. Subscriptions are another big source of sneaky budget drain. A CNR research study recently found that consumers estimated they spent an average of $86 per month on subscriptions. However, after reviewing their itemized expenses, the true average among those same consumers was actually $219 a month. That is a huge budget discrepancy. And those are just two examples. Who knows what you'll find when you do a thorough examination of your own spending? To get started, you'll want to go through your itemized account activity, review your credit and debit card withdrawals for the last year if that's possible, and then take back control of your finances. Another great way to trim your budget is to make some minor lifestyle changes that pack a big punch. Switching to a new auto insurance company if you're a driver is always a great option. There are so many to choose from these days, and as a new customer, you'll be able to take advantage of promotional incentives to switch over. This same concept can be applied to your cell phone carrier, cable provider, and more. The same goes for your credit cards. If you're carrying debt, look into options for balance transfers with a new credit card. A year of interest-free interest payments can go a long, long way to help you resolve debt. Also, consider making some eco-friendly changes. Going green is not just good for the planet. It is also fantastic for your budget. The average American household spends nearly $200 on paper towels alone. Consider switching to reusable rags for cleaning, cloth napkins instead of paper ones, dishes and silverware instead of paper and plastic, Reusable is much more inexpensive than disposable. Changing your thermostat by one degree can have a 3% income impact on your energy bill. With energy costs continuing to soar, you can literally reimagine your entire budget by keeping your AC a few degrees higher and getting a fan. The benefits of a solid budget plan extend way beyond your career transition plans too. Maybe you're on a tight budget now and you need a little breathing room, or perhaps you're comfortable with your budget, but you wish you had a little more spending freedom. Whatever your personal situation, it is never a bad idea to be in control of your spending in a positive way. There's a lot to consider when making a major life change in terms of how it will impact your financial stability. And of course, it's important to include all the different aspects of salary when evaluating a new career or job. If you're making a move from an office or on-site job to a remote one, you may find you can stretch your salary a bit further once you eliminate commuting costs, wardrobe, uniform. But it's also important to remember that a remote job will likely require high-speed internet, and you may have to upgrade on that one, as well as purchasing your own office supplies, ensuring you have an adequate workspace. Will you need to buy a new desk, a new chair, noise-canceling headset? Consider making a comprehensive list of all the small lifestyle, lifestyle changes that will be tied to your new job. Include things like taxes, dining out, gas or transit costs, insurance, retirement benefits. 
maybe you're going that way you're going in with a full picture of what to expect the most important thing to keep in mind is to factor in all the aspects of your potential new job and not just the salary itself there's also plenty to consider when making a career transition in general. And Jen has also already given us a ton of food for thought on that one. But when we're talking about how well positioned you are to make that transition, it pretty much all hinges on your ability to actually land a job in your new field of choice. And there's one thing that can really make or break that, and that's your resume. Now, as you know, this is only the first in a three-part webinar series, and next week I will be going over the resume writing process in tons of detail. So we won't do that today. Today, we'll lay the groundwork, and we're going to focus on determining which qualifications you have that are transferable, identifying the requirements you'll need to meet for your new field, and preparing what will become the content of your career transition resume. The most important element in a career transition resume is transferable skills. Your universally applicable skills that are going to help you bridge the gap from one field to another. You won't be going in with a competitive amount of relevant industry-specific experience. Instead, what you need to focus on are the skills that make you highly competent, trainable, and competitive in other ways. Unfortunately, as important as these transferable skills are, a recent live career survey found that over 50% of workers were unsure of how to identify their transferable skills and were also unsure of how to include them on a resume. If you're included in that group, not to worry. We're going to start right there. The easiest way to get started identifying those transferable skills is to compare the job description of your current position to the one you'll be applying for. You're looking for keywords that are found in both descriptions or job postings. These skills and experiences, the ones that are required to do both jobs, will be the strongest part of your resume. You'll want to highlight them throughout. And some positions are going to have a really great overlap. One very common career transition that we see in employment trends is from recruiter to HR manager. Although these are two very different jobs, they both fall under the umbrella of the staffing industry, so there's a lot of overlap in the skill sets required to do that. Let's take a look at the side-by-side -side of these two job descriptions. As you read through them, there's a clear and obvious relationship between the positions. They require, in some places verbatim, a matching set of skills and experience. In this situation, even though you're making a career transition, you can still rely on the same core set of skills for your resume, but it may not always be that easy. Once you're talking about going into a completely different field, things get a little more complicated. Here we have two very different job descriptions. On the left is retail manager. Retail is one of the industries with the highest rates of departure in the job market right now. On the right, we have financial planner, an industry that is predicted to see a fair amount of growth over the next 10 years. A side-by-side -side comparison of terminology and responsibility looks pretty meager. But if we look a little deeper, we can find some really promising overlaps. The next step is to translate our resume from our current industry to our new industry's language. This means finding terms that are different but they indicate the same type of skill or knowledge base. You may find after you've translated some of these terms that you have a lot more relevant experience than you originally thought. Let's talk military. When you're first getting out, there are a lot of resources provided to help you with this transition through the TAP program, but really a few weeks of classes, how much can that really prepare you? Once you get out, it can definitely feel a little bit like you're on your own. 65% of veterans say they experienced a difficult transition from military to civilian life, and 70% of veterans have reported that finding a job in the civilian workplace was their biggest challenge. The transition from military to civilian in itself is difficult on a number of levels. When you add to that the pressure of trying to find a job in a workforce for which you may feel shockingly unprepared, it can double down on your stress level. No matter what your job was in the military, our job satisfaction was inextricably linked to the pride we took in wearing the uniform. And that can be a very hard act to follow. 
There's a difference between getting a job when you get out and beginning a rewarding career in the civilian workforce. So here are some great steps that you can take to make sure you land the job you truly want. I cannot stress enough how valuable the JST is going to be for your crossover into the civilian workforce. It's a veritable goldmine of plain English terminology to describe your military training and education. Go through your transcript very thoroughly and make sure it's a part of your digital portfolio, which we'll talk more about in a bit. Whether you're looking for a civilian job that's comparable to your military one or entering a completely new field, the JST is chock full of both technical and transferable skills that you can load into your resume. Additional duties can also be a fantastic resource for transferable skills. When I was in the military, some of my additional duties included tool room and supply surgeon. There are no civilian jobs that I can think of off the top of my head that have ever listed those exact skills or job experience in a posting. However, you see plenty of jobs that list inventory management, equipment maintenance and management, orders and purchasing, procurement and fulfillment. Turns out that even though I was an aviation mechanic, I have a lot of relevant skills in logistics, sales, and supply management. Even if I don't want to enter those fields, these are some great transferable skills that would be helpful to me in any industry. No matter what branch you were in, you should take advantage of the website armywriter.com. It's a website that was created to write NCOERs for the Army. And it has tomes of incredible bullets for any MOS, as well as basically every additional duty there is. These bullets can become incredible resume bullets, as long as you remove the acronyms and jargon. Just remember, the key to this process is to make sure your resume lists all your skills in the language of your new intended field and not your current or previous one. Military experience is full of hidden gems, even in some unlikely places. If you've ever pulled a barracks guard shift, not exactly the first thing we think about when we're drafting our crossover resume when we get out. CONUS guard shifts were the absolute worst, but from fire guard and basic training to CQ duty at the barracks, I'm pretty sure we've probably all been there in some way. Aside from the obvious boredom, junk food binging, and exhaustion, believe it or not, you've also racked up a few transferable skills. Accountability checks, manning the phones, maintaining personnel and visitor logs. However painful those mundane tasks were at that time, those are actually really useful skills in the civilian world. Grab a notepad and a pen and think back about your time and service and everything you did. There are tons of those hidden gems. All you need to do is take a little time and get creative. The most important tool you have as a transitioning veteran is your community. Military to civilian resumes are called crossover resumes because even if you do plan to pursue a career in the same field, you're still making a major transition, the transition from military to civilian workforce. No one is better equipped to help you in that process than a community of veterans who have made the transition themselves. And in a workforce where professional networking results in around 80% of hires across all industries, professional networking as a veteran is doubly important. Don't try to do this on your own. There's no reason for it, and it's not necessary. Taking off the uniform doesn't have to break the bonds formed in service. Create a strong, diverse, professional networking presence in both civilian and military spaces, and you'll always have the support you need. There's one important note that applies whether you're military or civilian doing any type of career transition. Translating skills can be tricky. You absolutely want to utilize your skills and experience as much as possible to create a competitive and effective resume and portfolio and to give a full picture of your potential as an employee. The goal is to showcase your skills as much as possible across all fields, but you also need to make sure you're not misrepresenting yourself. Ensure that you take care and be thorough in your research before adding skills to your resume and portfolio. 
Not too long ago, I was advising students and resume clients to limit the emphasis of soft skills in their resumes and to focus on hard skills, education, and certifications. That advice is no longer as relevant as it once was. In today's job market, which is, again, being largely defined by its volume of career transitions, soft skills are highly in demand. Rohan Rajiv, the Director of Product Management at LinkedIn, recently stated that soft skills were featured in 78% of jobs globally. And a McKinsey survey found that the proportion of companies addressing empathy and interpersonal skills doubled in 2020 and continues to rise. This means your resume can now be enhanced by some highly transferable skills that bring added value. The key to doing this is to identify the soft skills that will be the most useful in your new industry and ensure that they're the ones that you're showcasing from your previous work history. It goes without saying that in order to be considered for any position, you must meet the minimum education requirements. But if you're transitioning to a new career, it helps to do some research and find out what other education and certifications might make you more competitive as an applicant. This can impact not just your potential to be hired, but also your starting salary. If you are applying to be a bartender and you've recently completed bartending school, maybe consider taking a food handler's license. If you're applying for a job as a teacher, consider a specialty certification. If you're going for an HR position, a diversity, equity, and inclusion certification would be a very beneficial thing to have. Whatever industry you intend to enter, Researching and then obtaining those additional education and certifications to supplement your relevant work experience is a great way to make your resume more competitive and help you land that interview. If you want to look into additional education and certifications, there is no shortage of online options. When it comes to professional development, you can obtain a variety of certifications at your own pace and without ever leaving your home. This is just a small example of some of the sites that offer great online professional development training courses. No matter what field you're going into, technology skills are a huge part of today's workforce. Every industry relies on some amount of automation, cloud technology, digital data transfers and storage. We are living in a tech world. Staying current in your technical knowledge is a major factor in the job market. These are some great sites that offer training in really valuable, marketable tech skills. Having an updated digital portfolio will help you tremendously in your career transition and in your job search and applications. A file on your computer, an external hard drive, thumb drive, it doesn't really matter what you use as long as you have all your hiring records together, organized, updated, and easily accessible. This should include your resume, cover letter template, education records, military records, certifications, any document that could potentially be relevant to your new field. Having this resource will greatly reduce your time spent and stress level while going through the application process. Nearly 90% of recruiters rely on LinkedIn as their most effective platform for vetting job candidates. That means it's one of your best tools for professional networking and you wanna use this to your advantage as you begin entering a new field or industry. Building a professional network in your new industry is crucial. Before you start applying, you wanna make sure your LinkedIn profile reflects your new industry and your updated career transition resume. If a recruiter or hiring manager receives your application, checks your profile, and sees a page dedicated to your previous industry, it won't encourage them to pursue you as a candidate. Be very thorough here. Add your transferable skills in industry-appropriate terms to the skills section. Highlight your transferable skills in all your previous work history and add all the relevant education and certifications you have or have obtained recently. And most importantly, be sure to change your title, headline, and summary sections to reflect the transition, since those are the very first things that a recruiter is going to see on your page. 
You can even put some details about your transition readiness and qualifications in the summary section as if it were a cover letter for prospective employee employers. Start following some organizations and people in your new intended field. Stay current on the news and the goings on in that industry and browse some of their profiles to compare your own and ensure that it looks recruiter ready. Once you've got your budget plan, your portfolio, and your digital networking presence squared away, you'll be ready for the next step, resumes and applications. And that is the perfect segue into our next steps. We hope you'll join us for the resumes and cover letters webinar on March 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern to hear more from Rachel on how to construct an exceptional resume and cover letter. And don't forget to mark your calendar for the last webinar of our career series, The Art of the Interview. That's on March 30th and will be led by Rachel Ekman and Amy Dietzman. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Maxine to lead us through some Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Tons of fantastic information uh, that I think pretty much everybody can utilize. Um, so before we get to the questions, there are just a couple of things that I wanted to go over. First off, on your screen right here, you're going to see all of our different social media pages as well as our YouTube page. On our YouTube page, that's where you're going to, going to find all of our previous webinars, and we also upload every single webinar that we do on there. So if you're ever curious about some of the different topics we've done in the past, whether the student success ones or previous career webinars, you can find all of that stuff over on our YouTube page. And then following us on socials is really going to be helpful because anytime we have any new uh, series coming up, you'll be able to get information about them that way. Uh, and then one last thing before we get to the questions, which again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop those in the question box. I did see a couple of people asking about recordings, transcripts, or some of the different resources that were, we went over in this presentation. Uh, there will be a follow-up email that gets sent out in the next couple of days that will have a recording as well as a PDF version of the slides. So any QR codes that you might have missed, you'll be able to access that way as well as all of the different uh, resources that were shown at the very end. And this is one of those pages uh, with those QR codes. So again, all this will be in a follow-up email that you'll have access to uh, in the coming days. Now, one of the questions that did come in, uh, Rachel, was about kind of online certifications and how far they'll get you, especially if you're going from a non-tech job to a tech job and you maybe don't have as much crossover. Do you have a recommendation on like how many uh, certifications you should get uh, before making that transition? That's a great question. The there's, there's a two-part answer. <laughs> Part one is that online certifications are incredibly valuable. I think in a lot of ways, people sort of tend to still have this maybe dated image of them as, oh, you know, anyone can go online and get ordained as a minister type of type of thing. But it's not, it's not that way anymore because so much education and certification has transitioned to online that online certifications are highly credible, highly valuable on your resume for sure, especially if they're related to the industry you'd like to transition into. The second part to that is that I, I am a huge fan of the more the merrier when it comes to certifications, but what you might want to do is prioritize them because there are going to be occasional costs associated with some of these certifications, not necessarily high costs, but some. So you'd want to prioritize them by what you find to be the number one key skills for that particular industry. So for example, let's say you're going into the computer programming field and the the particular, like your number one favorite job that you want to land, then the top three things that they mention are um, SQL Server, Python, and Java. So those are going to be your most important certifications to get. Anything else would be great and it would be gravy, but the ones that you want to focus on are the ones that are the most highly valuable in the industry you're seeking. And, and I would say maybe even go a step further, look at your number one job, the one that you want to go to, but then also compare it to a few other jobs that are very, very similar in title and in, in specifications and make sure you're grabbing 
a, a nice average, right? Make sure you're looking across the industry and saying, okay, for this particular job, they want me to have Python, but these other guys aren't as focused on Python. They're more involved in Hira or whatever it is. So do your research prior to doing the certifications is, is my best advice there. Awesome, thank you. We got another really great question about how important are references when you're targeting a completely different field? Uh, so what do you do if the reference that you have are unfamiliar with that connecting jargon uh, that could help link the two fields together? How do you kind of navigate that? Also a wonderful concern to have. The thing I would say is to talk to your references, talk to the people who you're going to ask to provide references for you and ask them to please focus on your transferable skills. Because when you provide references to an employer, it's not necessarily for the purpose of saying, I can verify that Rachel Ekman is exceptional in her Excel Microsoft Excel skills. They're going to say Rachel Ekman is a team player or Rachel Ekman has a strong worth work ethic or whatever the case. So it's those things that they are that they are vouching for, if you will. And you can take that a step further. If there's a particular transferable skill that's important to you that the employer is aware that you have, for example, Let's say it is, you know, Microsoft Office, that that's a great transferable skill. It's something that's mentioned a couple of times in the job posting that you're applying for. Go, don't be afraid to talk to the people who are, who are providing your references and say, hey, look, this job is big on Microsoft Office skills. So if you could throw in there that I provided a training to the company for people, new incoming employees on how to use that. And here's the ways that I added value to the team utilizing that particular skill. There's no, there's no shame even in helping them, I'm not saying write your own references, but <laughs> helping them to draft some of that language and say, hey, would you be comfortable saying this about me? You know, there's no reason to assume that you can't be involved in the referring process. Amazing. That's actually like incredibly helpful because that has always been kind of a struggle of people that I know uh, when it comes to references and making sure that they talk about the things uh, that are going to be most relevant. Um, and then I think I see one more question. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times that when you kind of transition to a new uh, title or position, you're often going to be taking a step down. Um, is there any way to estimate how long you'll be at that lower position or the growth rates of different uh, jobs or different career paths? Yes, and that's huge because uh, again, in order to get that great job, and this is, by the way, something that I have done myself, I have taken steps down to get where I wanted to go. So I don't see it as necessarily a step downward, more as just a sidestep in pursuit of a different, a different elevation. <laughs> but, but yeah, there is often going to be the chance, you know, if you're, if you're at an expert level in your current field, but you're entering a new field where you have the, the requisite education and certifications, but not nearly as much experience as those who've been in the field the, the same length you've been in your current one, right? You know, you, let's say you're 10 years into your current position and field, you're going to go in at zero years again. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to take a pay cut, but very often it does mean that you're just not going to start parallel to or laterally equal to where you are right now. In order to do that, the best thing to do is, again, get your finances completely prepared for this transition. If you do have to take a, a minor salary cut, or if you do have to, you know, understand that there's going to be some time before you're going to be able to get that first raise. And then research the organizations. You can go on Glassdoor is a great great one, a great reference to use. You can find all kinds of different sort of um, idiosyncrasies in each job field and each organization and company. I always tell people to do median and not average. And what I mean by that is sort of disregard the top three and bottom three reviews of any organization and look for that sort of middle ground because you're always going to have disgruntled employees and you're always going to have people who, you know, 
just think everything is sunshine and roses all the time. You want to find those middle ground people, those people who have, you know, a little bit negative to say, a little bit positive to say. It feels a little bit more tempered than emotional in their reviews. And make sure you find out, you know, this company has people who are saying that they've been working for the company for five years without a raise, or these people are saying, oh my gosh, I was with the company for X amount of time and I got promoted and I got a raise. So look at the real-time experience of people who have or are currently working for those organizations before you apply. And then again, lean on the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I live on that website. It's like the number one bookmark on my, on my browser. It gives you so much great information. If you see, and this is very important, if you see an industry, and this is your career transition industry that you want to get into, and it has a projected decline, or even a projected plateau, think twice before making the transition. Because the unfortunate truth is that in the, in the terrible event that a company has to do layoffs, not including you know, performance concerns, unfortunately, the last people on board are very often the first people to be affected by layoffs. So before you get into an industry, even if you've got this great high dollar salary change carrot being dangled in front of you, make sure you look at the projected growth of that industry. Are you going to potentially be subjected to layoffs? And, and another to that same end, another thing to consider is the history of the company. If you're applying for a company that sounds too good to be true and it's only a year or two old, consider the fact that it might be too good to be true and maybe just pause and think twice before you get involved in a company like that. Only because it would be your first sort of segue into that industry. Uh, you actually mentioning all those sites brings us to, I think, our last question for the day. And that is, uh, you mentioned how LinkedIn is going to be incredibly important when it comes to professional networking and finding recruiters and all these different job positions. Are there any other professional networking sites or platforms that you recommend folks look into or is LinkedIn the main one? LinkedIn is the one that I always recommend because LinkedIn is something of a um, sort of industry standard at this point. There are, there are tons of other, you know, I, I, I could give you a list. I, I can provide you a list of them if you'd like to share them in the resources. I'd be happy to do that. The reason, again, that I recommend LinkedIn is because it's so highly used by recruiters. It has more companies than I think, and I, don't quote me on this one, but I think every other <laughs> professional networking site combined. <laughs> um, it's, it is, it is an extremely robust platform. And the other thing to keep in mind with LinkedIn too, one of the other reasons I recommend it so highly is because it's incredibly linkable. Um, you can, you can link it to your Gmail, you can link it to, you know, all kinds of different things. And you can also take professional development and online certifications right within that platform. So it's extremely helpful to have that as well, where you can say, okay, you know, I want to go in and I want to get a badge or a certification in XYZ subject. And LinkedIn Learning also provides all of that sort of capability and potential as well. So you really can create, even just within that one platform, a very robust portfolio for your professional portfolio. Oh, perfect. And yeah, if you could uh, share that list of different platforms and we can include that in the follow-up, that would be great. I think that could be really helpful for some folks, but Absolutely. thank you thank you again, Rachel, and thank you, uh, Jenna, for joining us today, uh, presenting all these different resources and bits of information for folks. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all at our upcoming webinars.